Welcome to Durham Needs to Know. I'm your host, Karen Cheney, a former Registrar of Voters in Durham, Connecticut. Today, I will be talking how to vote absentee in Connecticut, the practical aspects. I will discuss a little of the larger issues around the concept of absentee balloting, but I plan to do a whole segment on that later. Basically, voting absentee ballots can be complicated and you want to follow the directions that are included with the ballot. Your town clerk issues and receives absentee ballots. All questions and ballots should be directed to her. There are three stages in voting absentee. First, you must get an application for an absentee ballot, fill it out, sign it, and return it to the town clerk. Second, the town clerk will process your application by determining if you are a valid voter who is eligible to vote in this election. She will determine which ballot should be sent to you and record when she received your request and when she mailed your ballot back to you. Finally, you receive the ballot, you mark it, and you return it to the town clerk. You can apply for an absentee ballot beginning January 1st of the election year. The application will be held until the ballot is finalized and ready to mail. There are many types of absentee ballots which we won't go into here today. Just know that the town clerk can send out certain types of ballots up to 90 days before an election. They have sent them to war zones. They have sent ballots to Peace Corps voters on isolated islands and researchers in Antarctica. If you have a special situation, contact the town clerk. But for all the rest of us, absentee ballots usually go out the first week in October. So if you send in your application in August, the town clerk will hold it until the ballot is finalized after any primaries and withdrawals, and then send it to you in the first week of October. Okay, to get the application, you can download one from the town hall or the Secretary of State's websites, or you can go by the town clerk's office and pick one up there, or request that the town clerk mail you one. If you go in person after the ballot is ready, you can pick up the application, fill it out, give it to the town clerk, and then she will give you a ballot. You can vote the ballot there in town hall, and you're done. Or a parent or a friend can get an application for you, but the third party must fill out their information with the town clerk. We must often see this situation where a parent or friend gets an absentee ballot when parents are visiting their children during parents' weekend in October. The voter must sign the application. Your parents or your spouse can't get the application and sign it for you. It must be your wet signature, meaning you can't fax it or email it back. It must be the original signature. After you, the voter, have filled it out and signed the application, it can be returned by your parent or spouse or mailed back. Pers personal intermediaries can be unreliable, so if you do not get a ballot when you expect, be sure to contact the town clerk. We have heard stories of parents uh, losing their kid's voter, uh, absentee ballot application. When you get your ballot from the town clerk, follow the directions carefully. Okay, this is a sample ballot. The town clerk will <coughs> send you a ballot. You open it up. They have a number on it where each number is, um, is associated with the, per with the ballot application. You open it up and you have lots of paper inside. There are, in, there's information, there's notice about returning your absentee ballot. Your absentee ballot is almost always yellow and here is your inner envelope. Okay, so this is an example from the Republican primary in September. So it's not the same as the November election. Okay, when you get your ballot from the town clerk, after you fill out the ballot here, you, return, you put it into the inner envelope. You seal the inner envelope and you sign it right here and you date it. If it's not signed, I can't count your ballot, okay? Sign and seal your ballot. Then you put the inner envelope into the outer envelope and you seal it and if it is being returned by somebody who is not the voter, you put your information down there. <coughs> the 
they tell you this in the directions, and they also remind you, don't let somebody else return your ballot except for a few special people. Put only one ballot in the inner envelope. Don't save money on stamps. Send each ballot separately or all of them will be voided. I have personally had to void two ballots from a married couple that were included in the same inner envelope. We must be able to determine who voted a ballot. After you insert the inner envelope into the outer envelope, sign it and return it to the town clerk. Only certain persons, such as family members or caretakers, can return a ballot for you, as seen in what is happening in Bridgeport. Even with family members, the town clerks get ballots returned past the deadline and have to void them. The deadline for when an absentee ballot has to be returned varies by states, so the delay might be a misunderstanding, but your vote still won't count in Connecticut. If you did not pro provide proof of your identity when you registered to vote, you are considered a, basically a provisional voter who must prove their identity and residency at the election. But if the first time you vote is by absentee ballot, you must prove it then. So you enclose a copy of your driver's license or proof of identity and residency. Whether you have to include your proof of identity and residency will be included in the information packet that is included in your absentee ballot envelope. These laws change according to the nature of the election, so if you have a question, contact the town clerk. Okay. Once you sign and seal the envelope, don't open it again. This may seem obvious to election workers, but it is a problem that can lead to voided ballots. If I come with a clearly opened ballot, I do not know if it's been tampered with. If you realize you had forgotten to include a copy of your driver's license or you have another problem, call the town clerk. If you had help filling out the application form or the ballot itself, make sure that the assistant fills out the information on the application form of the ballot envelope. Don't include any identifying information on the ballot itself. Any ballot with identifying information has to be voided. The absolute Tea ballot drop-off box can be used for both ballot application forms and for the absentee ballots themselves. It is secure and empty daily, if not multiple times a day. You must fill in the information on the outer, on the outer envelope if you're using the ballot box. So what happens after you've, got, you've gotten the ballot, you've voted it, you've returned it? The town clerk receives and records all the requested and received absentee ballots. She turns the ballots over to the registrar of voters on election day for the ballots to be tallied. In municipal elections, the ballots are usually included with the polling place ballots in the tabulator. In referenda, they're usually hand counted. In federal and state elections, because Durham has three different kinds of ballots, absentee ballots are usually counted centrally and not with the polling ballots. Some absentee ballots often end up being hand counted because of voters' vision issues or unsteady hands. 90-day ballots must be counted by hand since they are sent out before the ballot is finalized and military personnel must handwrite their selections. Absentee ballots are processed and counted by election officials from each party and overseen by the election moderator with strict chain of custody requirements. Every year, the town clerk receives frantic phone calls as people realize they haven't started the process in time. Since the voter has to mail the application to the town clerk, the ballot is mailed back to the voter, and the voter's ballot is mailed back to the town clerk. So first of all, try not to get in that situation. Apply for an absentee ballot early. Second, call the town clerk. There may be exceptions that apply to you. Don't assume you can't vote. Call or email the town clerk. For example, there are sp special emergency ballots. If something happened in the last six days that keeps you from getting to the polling place, contact the town clerk. It is meant for being in the hospital, suddenly testing positive for COVID, mandatory bed rest, or something similar. We still smile about a town voter who broke her ankle on the way to the polls. She voted an emergency ballot from the Middlesex Hospital emergency room. So once again, call the town clerk. There are also special provisions for supervised absentee voting. At Twin Maples, both registrars observe the voting to ensure a voter gets to vote free of coercion or influence. If you are at a school or business with more than 25 voters, contact the registrars if you would like supervised absentee balloting at your location. Finally, if you can't vote, you can't vote. 
another person trying to vote absentee for a husband on a business trip or a parent for a student away from home, that's considered voter fraud and your name may be turned over to the State Election Enforcement Commission for investigation and possible fines or even jail time. In 2018, an individual was fined for doing precisely that. I can tell you I have had a voter call me at 11.30 at night on Monday night. Their plane was uh, delayed and they were not going to be able to get back to Connecticut in time to vote in the election on Tuesday. That does not mean it's a valid reason, but that doesn't mean that their wife can vote an absentee ballot for them. As you have figured out by now, absentee ballot voting procedures are cumbersome, but this is to protect your privacy and the integrity of the voting process. The Connecticut Constitution favors in-person voting. Absentee voting in Connecticut goes back to the soldiers in the Civil War. When Connecticut allowed absentee voting in its state constitution in the 1930s, it was at the forefront of popular voting, recognizing that voters might not be able to be present for in-person voting. The Connecticut Constitution limits absentee voting only for the voters' absence from the city or town of residence, sickness or physical disability, or the tenets of their religion forbid secular activity on that day. The legislative enaction, enactment of the law is at Connecticut General Statutes 9-135. This law is still in effect. The <clears throat> in recent legislative enactment of early voting will not be in effect this November. Early voting solves some of the problems for voters, but it is not the same as unrestricted absentee voting. That question is still waiting for approval by state voters to change the Constitution. During the COVID crisis, before tests were developed, any person could have had COVID and voters were treated as potentially sick allowing absentee voting, but we are back to needing a reason to vote absentee until the state constitution is changed. Absentee balloting questions have been around for literally thousands of years. It was an issue in ancient Rome for soldiers on military duty. The basic question of access versus security have not changed that much. It's where that line is drawn and what society can do to reduce risk while increasing access. The United States has to ballot secrecy in there also. Every time somebody says, well, if my bank can do this and that, why can't that incompetent government do it? And the answer to that is privacy. Even if you tell yourself, I don't care who knows who, how I vote, think of those whose jobs may be dependent on that vote or whose living conditions may be dependent. Because we live in Connecticut with a submarine base, this is an actual concern that Connecticut registrars have. How do we provide security for voters under the ocean on stealth missions away at sea for long periods of time without letting the commander of the submarine know how that person voted? The concern about the abusive process, the abuse of the absentee process remains, and these procedures are intended to help prevent against the most egregious forms of violations of absentee voting. For example, we don't allow voting by fax since it destroys both the privacy and the integrity of the vote. We try to ensure that every ballot represents the voter's intent. As the situation in Bridgeport shows, the issues are constantly being adjusted. Furthermore, each state balances those issues differently. What you see on TV often is poorly reported or applies a very different law. Persons get confused when the same words mean different things in different states and they often make invalid assumptions. Opinions differ on whether absentee voting should be done at all, how it should be done, how competing interests should be balanced, and the effect of another state's absentee voting practices on a nationwide election. Regardless of where you stand on any of these positions, Connecticut does allow absentee balloting if you follow the directions. If you have grasped anything from this talk, please remember to contact your town clerk, begin the process early, and follow directions. Thank you. And I'll see you at the polls, or maybe not. <laughs>